I like the way that you, with, with headphones. You look fine with headphones. <laughs> yes. Thanks for the compliment, man. <laughs> Didn't mean that to be, you know, exclusionary. <laughs> I'm feeling quite sexy with the headphones on, actually. I'm Arizona Family political editor Dennis Welch. Dennis, fake news Welch, try to tell the truth. And this is the Politics Unplugged podcast. Dennis, if you have a problem with substance abuse, I am more than willing to talk to you anytime you need. And welcome back to the Politics Unplugged podcast edition, our special, extra very special, an extra help of graving and, you know, uh, uh, what, potatoes and all that other kind of stuff. Thanksgiving edition. Um, it's just going to be Colin and I tonight, uh, producer extraordinaire, uh, just uh, breaking down um, our our best and worst of the of the past year. Uh, in politics, we're going to kind of rip off uh, from the TV show where last week we had some guests on that pre-taped uh, 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 their their you know list of who they thought had the best year in politics and who had the worst year in politics. Right. And but you know more importantly, after we do that, we'll take a quick break. And I know Colin is very excited about this. We will be revealing our top ten list for the best Christmas songs. Uh, that we think are out there, and hopefully we dug deep on this one. They're not going to be your traditional songs from traditional right. bands. Right. We're hoping that you can maybe discover some new Christmas classics, I think, at the end of the day. Yes. And the plan is, right, Colin, that after we release our list, we will then be publishing our list of our fa- of our favorite Christmas songs. Yes, we will put up a, uh, a Spotify playlist of them. We've got a Twitter account that we haven't really used, but it exists. Mm-hmm. At, it's uh, at AZ Unplugged. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel bad launching a Twitter account at the same time everyone else is jumping off <laughs> the burning ship. <laughs> <laughs> What so don't take this as any sort of endorsement. Twitter or X. Uh, yeah, yeah yes. right. Twi- Correct, Twi- yes. Yeah, we're, we'll Twix it out? Yeah. Don't um, take this as any sort of endorsement of it. Just it seems like it's the easiest way to send out a, a playlist. Um, you're not going to do a TikTok? I mean, if you want to do a TikTok, we can do a TikTok, man. I'm sure we can find <laughs> someone to help us put up a, a tickety talk for our little, our little Christmas playlist. And I'm, um, I'm actually switching around the cameras on this laptop, which is why you, you see me. Look, Look at that, Colin, taking, yeah. take, taking our listeners or our viewers behind the scenes yeah, here. Yeah, exciting. Uh, on this, uh, on this uh, very, very merry day before Thanksgiving. Yeah. And uh, so let's get rolling. Um, okay. You know, uh, best and worst of politics, uh, you know, over the past year. Let's start with the boring stuff. I know everybody probably wants to hear they, who, they, who we think had the worst year. Yeah, in politics, and I, I can only speak before we get to the list. I can only speak to you. Account. It was so much easier to come up with who had worst years. Yes, I mean I've got twenty honorable mentions, <laughs> and I was struggling to come up with like who had the best year in politics. Yeah, I mean I. To be clear, I think it says more about me than about the politicians or issues or whatever that's out there. And it's a non-election year for the most part, so the winners and easiers are, are uh, winners and losers are easier, I think, in an election year than they are yeah. in something like this. Um, but yeah, it was. I had more candidates for losers than I did for winners. I will say that far more because, like, the the, the whole exercise for me is like, um, I didn't want to put a lot of thought into it because I thought with lists like this, when you had top three, like who quick quickly comes to mind, right? Yeah, and I think those are like ultimately at the end of the day who you should probably be picking that kinds of stuff and who you end up picking anyway like don't overthink it who pops to mind but i was like god who had a great year in arizona in politics because i was trying to keep mine super local just to arizona right i think you maybe mentioned someone from the national level we'll get to that we'll get to that i have two two local one national on each of each of my lists yeah so so let's start there man i mean um let's uh let's uh, go this uh, go uh top three Okay. You give us uh, your third choice. I'll give you my third, and we'll work our way up okay. to number one. Number three for winners? Yeah. Number three, uh, this is my national pick, and this was tough. Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Fed. And this is sort of a Biden vote, I guess, yeah. Yeah. as well, but Powell's doing the work. It seems like not that long ago, 
we were talking about how a recession seemed inevitable and the the goal was the soft landing yeah. for the economy which no one really seemed to believe was going to happen mm -hmm. and now that's it that's what most economic folks financial folks say is happening i i saw there was a poll this week where financial people like 75 said 75 percent likelihood soft landing yeah. we're not hitting recession yeah so that's that's a fairly big victory there. I don't think too many people thought that was going to happen. Economic news has been fairly it's, And some people like, you know, who would listen to this podcast might take issue with that and say, well, I don't feel, you know, like this is a good economy. You look at the polling data out there. The polling data is like a lot of people don't think the country's heading in the wrong and, and the, is heading in the right direction. You look at the economic numbers. It does seem like, you know, uh, you know, job growth were historically low Yes. Uh, low unemployment, wages are up. Um, you know, it it looks and it seems good, almost like a morning in America. Yes. You know, but people are not feeling that way. Right. And there there are still issues. You know, debt is high. People's credit card debt is at mm -hmm. a high point. You know, housing prices are crushing for a lot of people. Oh yeah. So there there are issues, but yeah, the inflation's way down. There are a lot of uh, you know, unemployment is what it's under four. Yeah. Four is supposed to be the target. It's under four. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of good going on there. Yeah. And and you know, Powell can kind of claim a victory lap if they manage to avoid a recession <laughs> on this. So I was uh, uh, on my list uh, <clears throat> number three. Um, I came up with our state treasurer, Kimberly Yee, and uh, the reason why. I, I, I'm not saying anything particular that she did while she was in, has been in office this year. Yeah. It's not for any of that reason. You know, people who may be not familiar with that, that office very much is runs it can run itself. Yes. Um, but I, the reason why I say Kimberly Yee is because after last year's election, she is now the anecdote out there, the, the, the person people point to as, look, Kimber, as the Republican that if you run as a solid Republican or if people perceive you as a classic Republican type, you know, candidate or whatnot, you do very well. She yeah. was a statewide ballot. She got more votes than any other Republican last year. And I think that maybe this opens up possibilities for her moving forward. So as people have chatted about that throughout the year, I think that that is enough, you know, to give her, I think, a pretty good year in, in Arizona politics. Yeah, politics. I think so. And she was she was the statewide office that didn't have the MAGA endorsement. Yes. And won by a few hundred thousand votes. Yes, which you would think people could take as a sign that that's, you know, you can do pretty well in that spot. Once you get to the general, getting through the primary yeah. might be tricky. Once you get to the general, yeah. not having the MAGA endorsement can do well. For it, you. And this is what we call in the TV or pod biz uh, a tease, maybe a little bit of foreshadowing. But MAGA may or may not be on my list of losers. <laughs> okay. Solid tease. Uh, let's go. So my second or my second winner, mm -hmm. Ben Toma, and, and with a little bit of Katie Hobbs thrown in there, which yeah. is a you know an odd combo, but they got a budget done in like really a short period of time. Mm -hmm. When I think people expected a an absolute brawl for months, they actually managed to work together. I, I don't know how how great a victory it was for Hobbs and the Democrats, apart from the fact that they got it done and there was no blood loss. Mm -hmm. um, Toma, certainly, he got it done and there were no cuts to the uh, you know, school voucher program, Yeah, so, which is big for him. So that's a fairly, fairly sizable victory for him, I think. I mean, I don't think, you know, you throwing in Katie Hobbs is very weird at all, and you'll find out, and that will be revealed as to why. <laughs> but, yeah, my number two was, uh, actually, I went a little bit broader than Ben Tome. I went GOP leadership in the House and the Senate. And the reason why I thought that is for some of the same reasons you kind of laid out, um, particularly in a year uh, where there was a, still money to be doled out, most people will tell you those are more difficult years uh, you know, th those can be pretty difficult years, uh, you know, it, it, maybe even sometimes more difficult than it is years that you're going to look to cut programs. That's right. where you, like the blood sport, uh, the political blood sport comes out down at the legislature. And when you talk about that budget, yes, they did get that budget done with Katie Hobbs. Uh, what's interesting about that is a lot of people, a lot of Republicans I spoke with down at the legislature and, and whatnot, 
really enjoyed that, really liked that budget. They said it was a more Republican budget than a lot of Republicans have passed right. over the in the year. So I think they did a really good job with that. And I think Senate President, uh, the Senate President Peterson, took an interesting tact out there in Toma when they were in Toma uh, in the House, Speaker Toma when they were like, you know, giving lawmakers money to appropriate. You know, here's you know twenty thirty right. million. You go figure out what to do with that. Um, when that was first brought up, I mean, there were a lot of old school, old time you know, lobbyists down there who were like, oh my God, this is going to be awful. But it seemed to work out pretty well. Now, some of those expenditures are being questioned, you know, and I'm looking to Prescott at the rodeo there with their $50 million <laughs> appropriation out up, there. Yeah. And there's some other things out there because they're saying, oh, it's pork barrel spending. You know, when I was a kid, when you were a kid, um, you know, it was a different time. It used to be. Uh, politicians came back and they talked about the, the you know, the bacon they brought back uh, from uh, t- to the district. Yeah. Well, that bacon is now pork. Yeah. <laughs> See what I did there, Colin. That's um, so, but but anyway, it, it seemed to work out pretty well for them. And with divided government, I think yes, they did get that budget done a lot earlier than people thought. And they got from their perspective, I think they could feel pretty good about the things that they got in the budget and the big win for them. They protected the school voucher program. I mean, that might be one of the bigger losses for Katie Hobbs is that she wasn't able to get more done on that, at least a cap, um, an income cap on parents or some kind of some kind of, you know, uh, some sort of uh, safer, some sort of railing to, to, to hem some of this stuff in because the costs keep expanding out there. But yeah, pretty good year, I think, for them. And that probably is a fight she was never going to win. No, no, so, not with this. Fight. If she yeah. wants to win this fight, she knows this better. Katie Hobbs knows better than anybody out there. Then she needs to go out, and the Democrats need to go out next year, and take back the legis and take yes. take the legislature. Yes, it's hard for me to say to take back the legislature. I mean, the <laughs> legislature has been in Democratic hands forever. I think you got to go back to Republican hands. I in Republican hands forever. I think you got to go back to like nineteen sixty six or sixty seven. Wow. For the last, don't quote me on this, people who are listening. Go look it up for yourself. This is off the top of my head, but I think it was Jack Brown was the last House Speaker that was a Democrat back in the mid to late '60s. And the last time, and I do know this, um, you had a Democratic Senate President it was Pete Rios, and uh, I think in the late '80s, late late '80s, early '90s, after, and that was after ASCAM, which is one of the <laughs> one of the, one of the best political corruption <laughs> stories. Yeah. Of political corruption stories where undercover folks, uh, 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 you know, posed, you know, as as mobsters trying to get, uh, you know, gambling, legalized gambling passed in yeah. Arizona. You know, it's some guy got bought off with a three hundred dollar shrimp concession. Uh, another <laughs> lawmaker, you know, was bought off and was caught on on under uh, under uh, you know uh, on film saying, "I'm gonna die rich." You know, like really good, really good corruption, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's quality corruption. <laughs> that's quality. That's good. Entertaining corruption <laughs> yes. is what we're saying. Yes. Uh, I mean, a $300 shrimp concession? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, that's probably $500 shrimp concession in today's <laughs> What would money? that be worth? Do you got a calculator? <laughs> yeah. Can we can, can, can we figure that one out? <laughs> But that's the last time you got to go back for the Senate yeah. president, a Democratic Senate president with Pete Rios back then. Yeah. And that was like, you know, a cup of coffee and it was back to Republican hands. Yeah. All right. Uh, my number one winner for 2023, uh, Congresswoman <laughs> Debbie Lesko, mm-hmm. uh, who is retiring. <laughs> and it just. And Addition by subtraction. Yes. Um, she, she, it's been a weird year. In yeah. the House, yeah, they've had a lot of turmoil going on. Um, yeah, I mean, self-inflicted turmoil for the Republicans in the House, but she's managed to avoid that. Yeah, she has not been in the middle of that. She's sort of quietly done her job and uh, has a full pension and is going to get out. Hey, that's the important part, man. She got her pension. Yes, and gets to come home and stay here and not deal with the weekly flights and all that. That seems like a good year for Debbie Lesko. Good time yeah. to be doing something. Yeah, else. Debbie uh, and Lesko is like what's always weird, and, and like my my gut reaction with her out down there, and because I'd covered her in the legislature for a long time, is she, you know she was part of the Freedom Caucus. She was you know on the MAGA uh, you know, on the MAGA team, but I always thought like she wasn't full MAGA. 
she did enough to, to stay in their good graces. Like if it was a pool, she got into, you know, up to her knees or maybe her waist in the yeah. MAGA waters, but she didn't totally go, go into the deep end right. of that. Yeah. And I think she's just kind of fed up with everything. If he's any, if you've seen, you know, like they've been paying attention the past couple of years, I mean, you know, you can understand her frustrations down out there. I mean, look at look at this battle royales that that pop up uh, with electing speakers. Yeah, down there, and you know, Republicans, you know, sorry, you know, Republicans that are listening to this uh, this this podcast right now don't disagree with me. But the, the only message they've been sending to folks is that they that Republicans have a trouble have trouble leading and legislating. Yeah, no, it's been a mess this year. I mean, they they fired McCarthy and it was the first time that's happened yeah that, I mean, it's nuts yeah because the motion to vacate took one person like hey yeah. I, I, let's yeah. do this I mean yeah that's that's not that's not good for stability that's no. not good for legislating no it's not uh so that leads us to your winner my winner and again uh you know uh I put Governor Katie Hobbs number one now uh, it could have been le- legislative leaders you know at number one and Hobbs at number two Kind of like you, it's like the, I'll throw yeah. both of them in there, but you know, Katie Hobbs, I think, had a good year, maybe a little bit better, and I gave her the edge here because she did start off; it was a little shaky, but it seemed like she was able to course correct. You know, she got rid of some staffers, uh, you know, got some new people in place, and it seems like it's been chugging along, moving along pretty pretty well yeah. since then. She, you know, in a sense, did what she campaigned on. She was, you know. Uh, she killed legislation that she said she was going to kill. All a lot of the election legislation, all the election legislation that went up there, met her veto pen. You know, cultural war stuff that went up there that she didn't like. Veto stamp, anti LGBTQ, and everything else that yeah. she saw up there. It was you know met the veto stamp. I thought you know that was you know she followed through on that promise. Um, certainly some misses out there, but again she was able to course correct. And to me, that's pretty impressive. Every governor, you know, people listening to this, every governor starts out, it's a totally new thing. Yeah. There is no training ground for being yeah. governor. There's no like governor light. It's a, it's a big job and you need to learn how to, you know, wield power. Yeah. You need to learn like how big that office is. And nobody comes in and just starts rolling. No, you know, um, and she's in an entirely defensive position mm-hmm. when the when both sides of the legislature are Republican. There's only so much you can accomplish. You're mostly just going to set veto records. Yeah, she did. I, and look again, you know, you want to go back and focus on uh, uh, some of the stuff that didn't work for. Her. I think that's fair here. Yeah. Um, you know, the burrito bill. What a mess that was. Yeah, you know, it seemed like, unnecessary. I get the purpose of it. It seemed unnecessary and could have been avoided. And that was under the former chief of staff. I mean, the big issue was that. Is a quick recap on that. That was the home cooked meals. Yeah. They wanted to take away regulations to make it easier for people to sell food on the street. Um, you know, particularly people think of that kind of stuff like burritos, tamales that kind of stuff you know if she was planning to veto that an experienced governor would have stopped that from ever getting to their desk because they would would have you know or changed that bill before it got to the desk to get it to the point so they could sign that bill and spare them the kind of embarrassment that she went through on that that's all part of the learning experience um you know and that's again why i think you know being able to course correct was impressive. Yeah. Now next year we'll see. That's going to be where the rubber hits the road. Next year is going to be an election year, and I, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't know if you know this, but there's going to be some politics afoot the legislature yes. next year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With the election, year. and you're going to be looking at cuts, as I mentioned earlier. When you start looking at cutting programs, that's a lot different than it is like, okay, what do we spend money on? Yeah. And like again, that's where the knives cut out and come out. Not just to cut programs, but to metaphorically stick it in the back of certain people and programs out there. And it's going to be fascinating to see what she's what Katie Hobbs has learned this year that she can apply to next year. Agreed. All right, are we under the losers? Oh yes, the losers. The more this fun is part. The one thing I think everybody's <laughs> waiting for is the losers. <laughs> Okay. I mean, I feel like we should be like have like you know be playing Tom Petty into this. Even the losers. <laughs> Even the losers. Yeah. <laughs> I doubt that. All right. I'll go first. Um, 
loser number three mm-hmm. for me, uh, Abe Hamaday, who lost. Ooh, nice. Lost the election last year nice. for attorney general by the narrowest of margins. That was a few hundred votes. Oh yeah, to yeah. Chris Mays. Um, had a rough um, time in the courts. He was fighting it much like. It's a nice Lake. diplomatic way of saying. How <laughs> Thank you, you. Had a rough time in the yes. courts. He met with the same level of success that Kerry Lake did fighting the results in court, which is to say he he still ain't in office, (laughs) nor is he likely to be. And you would think after that sort of um, tough time, losing by such a narrow margin, you Mm -hmm. might try and go for a seat or a job that um, might be a little easier to get and he has found himself in a race for a congressional seat with about six or seven other people fighting for it, many of whom may have a more legitimate shot at it. Many of them that don't even live in the district. Yes, and I mean, so he mocks Blake Masters. Yeah, he he, he mocks Blake Masters for not living in the district in a video he released online, and I believe in that video you can also see the dot on on a map of where Abe Hamaday is. He's in Scottsdale because that's where he lives in Scottsdale because he doesn't he doesn't live in the district no. either. No. Um, he's up against Masters, who has likely more money on his side, mm-hmm. greater name recognition after running for Senate, mm-hmm. um, and essentially the same. But sort just of, putting out some curious ads. Yeah, yeah, but a, a fairly similar background. There, I would think they're fairly similar candidates. I mean, they ran sort of on the same ticket mm-hmm. last year. Um, he also has to deal with Ben Toma, who among the serious less MAGA, um, you know, someone who really wants someone with like legislative get stuff done experience, that's that's Toma's strength, and he has the Debbie Lesko endorsement. Mm-hmm. And then you've also got Trent Franks in the race, who held the position before. I don't know how much that's going to be worth. I don't know how much name recognition is left there. Well, how much name recognition is left, and how much do people remember on why he yeah. uh, res- yeah. uh, stepped down. It's not necessarily a good name at this point, no. which is probably, again, kind. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is that is an uphill battle, and one I think he will find to be difficult after what was already a, a tricky election last yes. year. Well, I, okay, so I'm going to start at number three, and I'm going to cheat a little bit because I could not figure out. <clears throat> I could not pick between these two. Number three is kind of a tie between MAGA candidates for the for the reasons you kind of laid out yeah. uh, with Hamaday, but that applies to all of them. Mark Fincham, Kerry Lake, yeah. Abe Hamaday in courts. Wow, they were yeah. celebrating appeals if they got were granted an appeal. Yes. They were celebrating that like it was a big win. Yeah, they were appeals. Yeah, um, you know, and it, it was, subsequently went nowhere. Y- y- yes, it subsequently they just went nowhere and. You know, um, I know they're not going to – they listen to this stuff. I, I, I know that for sure. Um, they're not going to be happy with that, but that's the facts. Yeah. The facts are they just kept losing and losing and losing. You yes. know, I know that, you know, Donald Trump promised a lot of winning, but, you know, for them in court, after losing elections, they did a lot more losing in court. Yes. Um, and so that's why they're on the list. They're tied with three with, you know, the Arizona Coyotes. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know. Okay. I mean, yeah. Good lord, man. Good lord. Um, I don't think they were expecting that loss at all. I, I, it, you know, from the way they handled that campaign, I don't think they were expecting an election. Yeah. They like they, it never seemed like it was a serious campaign. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is a supposed billionaire. You know, getting beat by grassroots activists. Yes armed with children's sidewalk chalk. Do you yes. remember that? Yeah. Where they held that, where the coyotes <laughs> were holding that press conference. Yeah, and I wrote think they stuff. moved it yeah. at one point because people had written nasty things, things in chalk. Uh, in chalk in, in, in the parking lot, <laughs> yes. and they couldn't get over it. And they just were, yeah. you know, yeah. vandals, you know, like these, these terrorists with chalk. Yeah. You know, like, dude, you're a billion dollar organization. Like your, yes. your owner's a billionaire. And they've You're built the, up so little goodwill in this community yeah, over the years. D- yes. It, it shouldn't matter in politics. You should want to look at the policy, but like it does matter. Like 
you put a loser on the ice yeah. year after year after yeah. year after year. You know, nearly get yourself evicted from Glendale. G from Glendale, yeah. And it was just like, you know, people in Tempe was like, nah, we don't want it. Yeah. And really, as these things go, and there are plenty of arguments on either side of whether the, a stadium plan is ever a good plan for mm. the voters, but as those things go, this was a pretty good one for the voters. They weren't, they weren't asked for nearly as much as you frequently see in these things. Well, and I think that this plan did, got tagged with that stigma, whether it was part of that or not. Yeah. Um, taxpayers here across the country are just fed up with anything yes. that's subsidized with public money, yeah. public funds. Because these are, I mean, because, I mean, bottom line is just broader picture. I mean, these billionaires who buy these sports organizations, these are all vanity projects for yeah. them. Just about, yes. I mean, point, uh, what's, uh, I, now, yeah. I, I mean, who's the uh, Balmer, the guy that owns the Clippers? The Clippers. Yeah, from uh, from Microsoft. I mean, how many billions is that guy worth? Yeah. Do you think he's really, I mean, he's going to try to run a profit, but do you think he cares if he loses it's, a few yeah. mil? Yeah, it's not a big concern. It's not a big concern because these are vanity projects yeah. for them. Yeah. Um, which there are still a few teams out there that are still where that's the company business, like the Bidwells. Yeah. The Cardinals, the company business. And or I, the Lakers, that's yeah. the company business yeah. for the bus family. But they're really getting rare. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think I think part of the problem is they didn't maybe they just didn't recognize that and didn't take this campaign very seriously. Yeah. Because Tempe, you know, love Tempe, a special place in my heart, lived there for a long time. My first uh, job reporting on politics was covering the Tempe, uh, Tempe uh, City Council. Um, you want to win stuff down there. You got to be talking to those neighborhood groups. Yeah. And you got to be talking to them early on and get their buy-in and get their perspective, yeah. um, because that, that's just that's that's the facts, you know. And I don't get a sense that that happened. No. And so you know, this grassroots organizations they will come in and like you know raise some serious questions about that and 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 get people moving on this. And it wasn't like this was a narrow loss; it was a shellacking. It really was. It really was. You know, I mean, you got to think like these kinds of votes are going to be close to begin with. And I just never felt just watching it from the outside that this was a very serious cons campaign from the Coyotes perspective. Yeah. They're great. There you go. All right. My uh, my loser number two, uh, Liz Harris. Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, it's not often that someone comes into the legislature and only last three months, oh, but she managed to pull that off. Um, for those who may forget, because it seems like a long time ago, she's the one who arranged the speaker to discuss um, problems with the election. And that speaker said that, uh, based it all on a book, claimed that there were uh, Mexican drug cartels working with Katie Hobbs to overthrow the election and it was all being masterminded, as I recall, by the author's ex-wife and her mom. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was one of the wackiest, most, like, like craziest. I think I'm going to say that that's the craziest committee I've ever watched. <laughs> God, you know, I, I I, I've been so. down. I've been down there for 20 <laughs> years, and that was that was that was something else, yeah. man. Um, yeah. to watch that committee hearing. And, I mean, there's still plenty of MAGA in that legislature. There's still, uh, you know, you've got your share of election deniers and people who will buy into that. Yeah. And even they took a look at that and went, whoa, whoa <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> come on, It can't man. be this. Come on, bro. Come we, on. Can, we can deal with some level of extreme theory on this. Yeah. Um, our governor with the drug cartels and some guys – ex-wife nah, yeah man i mean if you're gonna that. if you're gonna go in committee and you're going to accuse the duly elected governor of arizona of like you know being in cahoots with you know drug traffickers or whoever or, or any kind of criminal syndicate like you better come armed with the facts yeah which um, did not seem to be the case no and 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 you know it's one thing it's one thing to, to go out and, and do that it's another thing to like get booted out yeah. by your colleagues yes 
which it wasn't a simple majority that did that. It was no. a, a super majority. Yes. Two thirds or something like that. Yes. A good chunk of her fellow Republicans had to go along with that. I mean, yeah. that was something else. Yeah. And for my number two, I'm going to go with, uh, you know, what could be potentially the Democrat, the Democratic version of that. And that's Representative Sun, who recently found herself in trouble when uh, there were three leaders uh, uh, from a city uh, that she represents who filed a restraining order against her because they felt threatened. And she's been accused of, you know, screaming at people, threatening to throw, uh, it was Tullison, right? Tull, you know, the city of Tullison, Tullison uh, city officials off balconies, you know, and just, and just acting completely inappropriate with that. Um, she's a Democrat from the West side that represents part of that district. Um, and, it wasn't Republicans who filed the ethics complaint against her. It was her fellow Democratic yeah. lawmakers who are now like going to run into, you know, uh, to other news outlets like our good friends over at the Arizona Agenda and talking off the record saying that she's been unhinged all year long or for, you know, for, for a while now. Now, Sun has responded through her attorneys to that ethics complaint and she is denying all of that. And part of the reasoning she's denying all this is she's saying, well, the person sh that was saying th she threatened to throw off the balcony is far too big for her to possibly throw off the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> Which doesn't mean the threat didn't take place. Yeah, I mean, I mean <laughs> but you know what? There's part of me that's like, you know, <laughs> there's maybe something to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But like you know, you can't go around doing that. If, you know, um, no. and, and you know, she claims. You know, the the other accusation is that she inter intervened in some child custody case, some transfer of a child somewhere, and claimed that she was working at the behest or somehow evoked the name of the state attorney general's office that she was doing something for them. She's also denied all of that. Yeah. So, but there you go. But 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 not good no. when your own party files an ethics complaint against you yeah. that could eventually lead to you getting booted out of office. Yeah. So we'll yeah. see how that yeah, happens. That's not great. All right. My, uh, my number one loser of the year, and I went national for this. Mm -hmm. um, remember when they were talking about Ron DeSantis being the next Republican candidate for <laughs> oh, president? Boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> he has gone from uh, being governor of Florida, which, of course, he still is, uh, and being... The big question was, well, is he going to take down Trump? Is he, you know, can he be the guy with a similar sure. worldview, but minus 90 some indictments? And can he be the candidate? Can he be the standard bearer for the Republican Party? And um, that person is now the guy who is campaigning while Politico does an article talking to three bootmakers to look at pictures of his feet to explain the crazy lifts he has in his boots. Oh, yeah. His poll numbers have absolutely tanked. He's one of those where even those close to him say the problem they're running into is the more voters get to know him, the quicker his poll numbers go down. <laughs> he's just an awkward dude. He's, he's awkward, and his political views clearly play well in Florida. Yeah. He's been... He's, he appears to be very popular in Florida. Um, there's some Florida man stuff going on there that I think doesn't play in the rest of the country, even yeah. among Republicans who who don't seem to have a whole lot of use for the guy. I, you know, so the, like, obviously I'm not going to be reporting on this kinds of things, but I am fascinated by the, by, you know, the, the thing formerly known as Twitter X yeah. social media, and it's obsession with the lifts because it is so <laughs> funny because like you look at him he just it's 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 uh, the way he walks is even awkward well he looks like he's teetering on stilettos yeah it's he like look, and there was <clears throat> an nbc news tweeted out a clip during like just uh here's a behind yeah. the scenes look during the debate yeah and during the little clip they sent out he walked across the stage and mm -hmm. it got retweeted a million times because just watching him 
try to walk in the boots that look, I mean. Yeah, I know, I, it's like it reminds me, it, it, there's many things, that, it, you know, covering politics, it reminds me of the movie Training Day when Denzel Washington's looking at the rookie and says, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. Yeah. I know Ron DeSantis is wearing lifts, yes. but I just can't prove yes. it. Yes. And the, you know, having these, like, high-end boot makers examine the photos like it's the Zapruder film. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was just brilliant. You know, they're actually looking, okay, you can see now where the ball of his foot is, and this appears to be an ankle bone, but you can see that the ankle appears to be about eight inches above the heel. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's the magic ankle theory. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sticking with the Zapruder film. Yes. So, yeah, not a great year for Ron DeSantis. No, not a great year. It's basically, it's going to come down to him. Can he win Iowa, the Iowa caucus or not? Yeah. And if he can't, he's probably doesn't make it out of there. No. Maybe he, you know, shows up for a cup of coffee in New Hampshire and he's out. Um, we'll see about that. Um, unfortunately, my number one is a little anticlimactic because you already had her at number two, but Liz Harris. Okay. Again, it just... It can't be reinst restated enough that like it, it it's just not good <laughs> when your colleagues boot you out of the legislature, yeah, man. It's not. That's tough. You know. But the other weird thing though is is like we've seen this happen more and more now, and like this used to be a tool that was in the toolbox, but you know it was the rarely used tool. Like, you know, I'm not a handy guy, so I don't know what's a randomly used tool, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, to me, I would just be using my hammer all the time for everything. Yeah. Yeah. But like, you know, it's, you know, but now we've been seeing this more and more as a thing where, you know, people are getting threatened to get, or there's threats to kick people out over these, these things. People have been kicked out of the legislature because of them. I mean, go back to Don Shooter. Yeah. Um, and it's just been, it's interesting now to watch that play out here in Arizona politics. Yeah, it has. So there you go. Winners and losers. Yeah. 2023, um, send your comments, concerns, or your disagreeable uh, e emails to Colin. Because nah. No? No, you nah, don't want them? No, okay. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, we'll be right back uh, when uh, Colin and I reveal our top 10 favorite Christmas songs. And welcome back to the Politics Unplugged podcast. And, uh, and you know, as it, uh, we're getting ready here for Thanksgiving, hopefully, I think this drops on, on uh, over the weekend. So hopefully yes. you've already had a great Thanksgiving, um, you know, a great Friendsgiving, however you guys, you know, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day or, or however you celebrate this day. Yes. Hopefully it's been great. It's been wonderful. Uh, but now we are officially smack nab into the holiday season. Uh, we got Christmas coming up. And with that, you know, Colin and I want to, again, tell us our what we think are some of our favorite Christmas songs. Yes. This is the time of year when you're bombarded with Christmas music. Yes. For some, that's great. Like, I can get in my wife's car in July and start it, and it will be playing Christmas music. Okay, there you go. So for some people are, are ready early, but this is when it really starts around Thanksgiving. And uh, I don't know about you, but I find most Christmas music to be awful. Oh yeah, yeah. And I, I so please tell me, Elvis Presley is not on your list. Elvis, Elvis did not make my list. Grandma loved Elvis Presley. I had to listen to a lot of Elvis Presley, yeah, Presley no, Christmas songs. No, and again, when we'll bring this up again. But we will be tweeting out this a playlist of our top 20, because I have a top 10, Dennis has a top 10. There might be some overlap. I know there's at least one a bit of overlap. Yeah, the number one is the overlap. I think, I think number one's overlapping on both. Um, but on our Twitter account, AZ Unplugged, we will send out the uh, Spotify Ooh. playlist of these. There. I believe it's called We Will Twixt Out. Yeah, Twix. whatever. whatever <laughs> say, whatever. It, say it, Colin. Twix. Twix. <laughs> we'll Twix it. On uh, at AZ Unplugged. All right. Um, Let's all do right. This. So my go I'm going through my list first. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, number ten, Feliz Navidad by Los Straight Jackets. Oh, I love that song. 
for and for those who are unfamiliar with Low Straight Jackets, they're a um, I believe Nashville-based surf guitar band that wears Luce Libre masks. Uh, yeah, they're very good. I've got kind of a surfy song on my list too. Nice. Yeah, because um, there's, there's something there's something nice about a little little surfy action with yes. Christmas. Yes. I don't know why I find that. Yes. I grew up in Southern California, so it all did. Yeah. There that's you what, go. That's there what you Christmas go. feels like for me. Uh, number nine, Christmas wrapping by the waitresses. Oh, that's like yeah. the one song people. Re- it's funny. It was sort of a novelty at the time. That's the one song okay. I think people okay. remember the waitresses for. Uh, number eight, uh, William Bell, sort of a forgotten great soul singer of the '60s from the mm-hmm. Stax label. Uh, song is "Every Day Will Be Like a Holiday." Oh, Stax, yes, amazing record label. If people yes. aren't familiar, go just yes. go download Memphis that. Memphis they're oh. wonderful. Isaac Hayes was very involved there. It. it Yes. Motown of the South, man. Yes, virtually everything was wonderful. Uh, also, number seven, another great soul singer that probably doesn't get his due, Solomon Burke, uh, the song Christmas Presents. Nice. Great song. I'm yeah. liking some of these polls, yeah. man, because I went more like rock and roll, punk okay. rockish. See, but I, I'm liking, I'm liking yeah. some of the soul stuff you're pulling I, out. I, yeah, I listen to, I always prefer the, the soul version of Christmas stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, it, you know. My my lists are always stuff like this, and if my wife is listening to Christmas music, it's more like Andy Williams stuff. <laughs> there's not a, I, in fact, I think there's one overlap. Hey, not everybody's as cool as you and I. That's right. That's <laughs> right. No, we've cornered the market on cool. Uh, number six, "Ain't No Chimneys in the Projects" by Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings. Yes, Sharon Jones. Uh, oh my God, I saw her once. Did you really? I never oh, got to see her. Oh, the late yes. Sharon Jones. Um, a wonderful talent. Everything, everything that Daptone Records touched, is wonderful. Yes. And the song "Ain't No Chimneys in the Projects." It's a it's a mom explaining to her daughter that even though they live in the projects, Santa will still find them for Christmas. It's a it's a great great song. Um, number five, two thousand miles by the Pretenders. Okay. Good. Never go wrong with the Pretenders, no. man. Uh, number four, and I don't know how many people in the U.S. have even heard this. I love this song, How to Make Gravy by Paul Kelly. Not familiar. Paul Kelly is an Australian singer-songwriter, beloved in Australia. He's a big deal there, who's never really cracked the U.S. All I know, big Australian acts, Men at Work and Midnight Oil. Yeah. And uh, Um, ACDC. Yeah. Crowded House, which the Finn brothers are New Zealand, but the rest of Crowded House was Australian. And I actually saw Paul Kelly open for Crowded House on their first tour of the U.S., um, the song is how to make gravy. And it, the whole song is a guy in jail, writing a letter home to his family, apologizing, saying he, he wishes he could be there for Christmas and giving them instructions on how to make gravy. Cause that was always his responsibility for the family meals. Oh man. It's nice. a wonderful song. Uh, number three. And like I said, here's, here's the one crossover between my wife's Christmas listing and mine. Christmas time is here by Vin, the Vince Guaraldi trio from the peanuts cartoon oh no. um it 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 there's also a great cover version by krung bin if you've ever heard them great band okay. but the original has that sort of weird melancholy quality that's just great uh number two christmas baby please come home by darlene love love that jam yes love that jam uh i also love the u2 version but i would feel like a jackass taking the u2 version over the darlene love version uh, especially as someone who grew up watching David Letterman and every Christmas he would have her on to do that. And number one, uh, the greatest Christmas song of all time, Fairy Tale of New York by the Pogues with Kirsty McCall. It's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful song. An epic song. Yes. It is... Um, if for those who are unfamiliar, you will have to check out the the playlist and listen to this. It, it much of the song is two um, sort of broken down, ill, degenerate drunks screaming at each other. Yep, um, it's not a pretty picture. No, it's not. And and it is one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. Yeah, it's legitimately beautiful, and it's it's out there. Hey man, when you wonderful. want to cry into your spiky eggnog. <laughs> Throw on the Pogues, man. <laughs> yes. Fairy Tale of New York. Yes. It's a great, great song. And uh, spoiler alert, we both have the same number one. Yeah. By the way, which we put together independently with yes. no collaboration. Yes. 
<laughs> Any other crossover besides that one? Uh, no, no. Right, because so number like, one, like, I love that you went with a lot of the soul stuff. Sharon yeah. Jones, Paul, Stax Records. Like, oh, yeah. God, yeah. I love that stuff. And I was yeah. like immediately regretting I didn't go down that route. But at least for our viewers, we're giving them a wide berth. I think, yes. you know, uh, you know, your songs will be, I think, maybe appeal to a wider, wider audience. I mean, mine are going to be... <laughs> Some a couple of deep pulls in the punk rock annals anal, anal, okay. of Christmas songs. All right, uh, but like, yeah, we'll go through this pretty quickly because we've already taken up quite a bit of time here on those podcasts. But I'm gonna, just going to say, number ten um, had to put this band on the list. Um, Rocket from the Crypts, Cancel Christmas. It is a real bluesy kind of downer of a Christmas song. Don't put this song on if you go, you know want to be dancing all night. But yeah. Rocket from the Crypt is one of my all time favorite favorite bands. Um, so um, definitely that. Uh, moving on from there, number nine, I've got the Vandals. Oi to the world. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're familiar with that, even I think. Yes, Oi to the I world. Am. And I I think no, uh, no doubt did it cover that as well. I'm sure. I'm sure yeah. a lot of these are most yeah. of these are most of these are are, are covers. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say that uh, at number what uh, number seven. I'm going to be all I want for Christmas is you by My Chemical Romance. Uh, <laughs> my My Chemical Romance. I you know God you know there's a few bands out there that just they're sappy, sentimental. There's no way I should like it, but I do yeah. and. <laughs> You scared the hell out of me with the song title. Because <laughs> I wasn't thinking that you were going to be going with Mariah Carey on here. You know, why, why you got pigeon- to pigeon- it- pigeonhole me like that, man? No, <laughs> All right. Oh, do we have Wham coming up here? <laughs> no, go ahead. All right, number six. Number six here on the list is Merry Christmas. I don't want to fight, fight tonight. tonight. Yeah. The Ramones, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I, I figured that was coming. The, it, it was a consideration for my list, but I, I figured it would be represented. Yeah. Yep. But, okay, this one, number five, is a little bit of a curveball. A little okay. bit of a curveball here. But I think this man gets is underappreciated in the history of rock and roll, even though he's well-known in rock and roll. But he's just under uh, you know underappreciated uh, for the impact. Because uh, I think he is rock and roll, and I think all rock and roll comes stems from him. Chuck Berry's "Run Run Rudolph." Yes, yeah, very <laughs> solid. And there have been a million great covers of that. A million great covers. Uh, we got to go to the original, man. Yeah, the original beats them. Yes. Yeah, I mean everything is a derivative. All rock guitar, yeah. or just a derivative somehow yeah. uh, of Chuck Berry, probably whether yes. you know it or not. Yes. Um, number four, we'll call it Christmas time. By a band called the Super Suckers. Love me some Super Suckers. <laughs> Eddie Spaghetti. Oh, that guy. Yes. That yes. Right. Yes. Give me some give me some more of that. Uh number three, Hark the Herald Angels Sing by Bad Religion. Oh. Now, oh God, it's like a Oh, a band that's synonymous with uh Christmas. Christmas. Yeah, Bad Religion, <laughs> Christmas, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I've not heard it. I can see that working. And he had, it's almost like a chorus. It starts off because, I mean, th- that band just has harmonies for days. Yeah. Harmonies for days, folks, uh, with, 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 their, with, their, with, their, with their with their punk rock songs. But, like, yeah. this kind of starts off like almost like a traditional type chorus. It's just wonderful. Nice. And, it's, and I'm going to go number two, old school. And this takes me all the way back to high school. I'm going to go with Silent Night from the Dickies. Just <laughs> just pure attitude, okay. the Dickies. And I don't know how much you listened to, to them back in the day. They're just loud. They're obnoxious. Yeah. Just pure attitude. Love Silent Night. Yeah. I love the fact that that band did a song called, a remake of a song called Silent Night. Yeah. That band... Not very silent. And it brings no. us to number one. We're back to, you know, Fairy Tale in New York, yes. the Pogues. What can't be said about that song that hasn't already been said about that song on this podcast? Yeah, great song. Um, one that I just discovered while putting together the list, and I wanted to put it on, except it, I couldn't because it's, um, it's bad. Do you know Iggy Pop did White Christmas? I am familiar with, <laughs> with I that love song. Iggy Pop. I do, too. I don't love that version. Do you ever you ever hear his song his his song he does a uh, Iggy Pop does a, a a song with a band called the Teddy Bears, 
and the song is I'm a I'm a punk rocker. I think is the name. I don't know that I've heard it. You should check that out. Okay, That's, that uh, could be a that could be a bonus track. We didn't discuss to do with this. Uh, worst Christmas song. Ooh, I haven't even put any thought okay. into that. Um, anything by Elvis? Uh, anything by Elvis <laughs> would co- qualify. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go. Uh, Wonderful Christmas time by Paul McCartney. Ooh, it's awful. Ooh, um, and not exactly a controversial choice. I don't think. I no, think no, no. Can I go? All I want for Christmas is you by Mariah. K- no, just kidding, kidding, folks. All right, kidding, folks. But I will say this: at the end of every Christmas season for the past however many years, I am sick and tired of that song. Yeah, you can't escape it. No, and that's the that's the biggest bummer for me. Yes, right. Like, you know, like forever. Like for some reason, I just hated the Grateful Dead, and then I realized I don't hate the Grateful Dead because I don't. I can avoid the Grateful Dead. Yes, it's some of their annoying fans. Yeah, some of their annoying fans. That I are spent very ten annoying years in Eugene, Oregon, where one cannot yeah, escape see, or avoid the, <laughs> the Grateful Dead. Yeah, right, Dead. right. But 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 the point <laughs> is, is like a song like "All I Want for Christmas," the Mariah Carey version. It's just everywhere. Yes, it is. Everywhere it during it's on jingles. It's selling me yeah. phones. Yes, um, man. I wish I could come up with what I would think is the worst Christmas song. It, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Is there like an eighties? Um, is there an eighties? We are the world type. Well, um, there's. Uh, do they know it's Christmas time? The that was the original. The you know from the people who brought you Live Aid. The you know. Do they know it's Christmas time? I don't know. I think we should use that for the cold open. <laughs> no. You singing. No. no. We're burying that a good 45 <laughs> minutes into this thing. I wish, I don't know. I'm, and usually I'm pretty good at like coming up with things I hate. Yeah. Again, that says a lot yeah. more about me, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it probably does. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. I just sprung that on you, so. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no problem. All right, so a reminder. It will come, it will come to me five minutes, ten minutes after we, 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 we conclude this. Well, we can, we can tweet it out. And we'll tweet it out. Be like, oh, of course. Yeah, the Paul yeah. McCartney one's a, you're coming terrible. In, you're coming in strong with that. Yeah, one. yeah, it's, it's a bad one. Again, playlist, we'll, we will have a, a Spotify playlist on our Twitter, Twix, X, whatever. Yeah. I wish there was somewhere else we could put it where people would see it, but there isn't. Um, I know where some people might want to put it. <laughs> yes. It's, and uh, the Twitter handle Twitter handle at az unplugged yeah. at az unplugged maybe we'll try to talk uh ch- talk uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to our, our 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 bosses and maybe they just post it out on the channel three maybe yeah az family as well cool sounds good but we'll see we'll see about that no guarantees on that folks no. all right i'll let you say goodbyes this time all right all right well thanks we're uh we'll be back in a week Everyone have a happy Thanksgiving, although your Thanksgiving's over by the time you heard this, so I hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. We'll talk to you all in a few days. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, the Google Store, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. See you next time.